introduce him, and he never did tell me what his talk, what the title was, or what the topic was. I'm gonna make him do it. Hi everybody, I'm Brian Pike. I am the harbor master here in Manchester. And I'll start immediately by apologizing for probably sharing lots of information that most of you already know. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the harbor as it exists today and talk a little bit about how it existed a oh, hundred or so years ago. Uh, I expect this PowerPoint to work fairly well. With any luck, there'll be one short video of the actual physical dredging in the harbor. If I can make it work, if not, I'll have to call Jim Starkey up here or, or <laughs> Ann. Uh, and there's only one slide with lots and lots of words on it. I do better with pretty pictures. So I guess we'll get started. I guess I should start by the, talking about the title, The Or Else. Uh, this is not a natural harbor, uh, is that right, Jim? We're not a natural harbor? No, we're not a natural harbor. This harbor needs to be dredged completely in about a 40-year cycle to maintain adequate depth. Now, that's partly my opinion. Uh, I believe that this harbor, in order to be maintained properly, should be dredged 25% every 10 years. Uh, it's very expensive to dredge. Uh, with the help of the dredge committee and the harbor advisory committee we've come up with some ideas that uh, if if they're implemented should a uh, make it possible to spend a little bit less less particularly on the next round of dredging and going forward spend less uh, in a in another area where we will need to dredge we'll see how it works out i expect to be around for at least one more dredging before i have to retire and then start a third one. Dredging is a big deal. It's important because if we don't dredge, we're not Manchester Harbor, <coughs> we're Jeffreys Creek. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so mooring density. We have a lot of moorings packed into this harbor. Uh, and we only have a lot of moorings because of dredging that has occurred. I'm sorry? Oh, yes. I thought you said dim wit. I, I, I was ready to answer. So, uh, here's our, our moorings, all of our different mooring fields uh, inside the drawbridge. This is where our fishermen congregate, our uh, boat yards, our area three or C coming out through the narrows into Proctor Cove and Whittier Cove the Yacht Club in Area 6, Long Beach, and then finally, Area 7. Uh, all told, we have a little over 600 moorings in this harbor, in this area. Magnolia is also our responsibility, and we have uh, just under 100 or so boats assigned up there. We are a natural harbor of refuge. Uh, we're a great place to be in a bad storm if there is such a thing as a good place in the water. Uh, Manchester is it if we were to ever have a hurricane. <coughs> all right, here's all the words I was talking about. Why do you dredge? Why do you spend, uh, as we just did, about uh, $1.3 million on dredging? Um, because a harbor generates revenue for a community. Uh, once upon a time, the waterfront was the main uh, resource for everything. Everything traveled by boat. Most uh, cities and towns are located on a water body accessible by vessel. And all the goods would come in by boat. We got away from that with planes, trains, and automobiles. And now uh, a lot of communities, as harbor masters uh, become more professional, a professionalized position, one of our jobs is to help communities realize uh, the revenue potential of the water bodies in their communities. So why do we keep dredging? 
because the harbor keeps getting shallower. This is a great picture that came right off the town uh, website. This uh, plume coming out of the marsh here. And this just settles and spreads out. You can see the murkiness right here, obviously after a rainstorm. So this is where the material is com coming from in our inner harbor. It's all organic material uh, coming from your backyard. In the outer harbor, out past Glass Head, past the Yacht Club, the issue is really the sand that uh, gets pushed around by the north northeasterly storms and uh, comes across the channel. As most of you know, we completed a dredging project uh, just about a year ago. The town started this project in 2011, before I came here as harbor master. And it took seven years to go from uh, the idea, the permitting, and the uh, testing that's required to get all of the permits so that we could hire a contractor and give them just an ungodly sum of money <laughs> to play in the dirt. <laughs> so the area, uh, the town in 2011, as I understand it, I wasn't here, but the goal was since the, the community was so far <coughs> behind, let's dredge the commercial areas. Uh, let's, let's make sure the fishermen can still get into the dock and that all of the boaters can still get to the boat yards to get hauled and launched and uh, get gas and pump that awful stuff out of their holding tanks. So uh, this is area B, Masconomo Park, right here. This is the area dredged to a controlling depth of eight feet at low tide. The same here, over in front of Crocker's in Manchester Marine. Uh, good news for us, the computer on the uh, barge with the crane broke, and they went down to 11 feet. So we have, <laughs> in some spots, over 11 feet at low tide. So good for us, right. We, we paid to nine. The way dredging works is, if you want eight feet at low tide, you pay to nine, because that equipment can't be exact. So you're paying for the volumes. So you dredge eight, pay nine, we got 11. Good deal. Good deal. Great deal. Uh, now there were other projects. Uh, some of the private property owners inside the drawbridge uh, decided to dredge, as did uh, Inner Harbor Marine and Manchester Marine. So this area here was dredged along the front. This whole area here and then inside the drawbridge, <coughs> private, the inside the drawbridge was all private. Now we were able to realize some cost savings in our project. We shared the cost of mobiliz mobilization, getting the equipment here with uh, the private property owners. Mobilization alone costs about a quarter of a million dollars wow. just to get equipment here. Uh, so, uh, the company that did this project uh, was Proc Marine, a company from Rockland, Maine. Uh, very familiar with them. They have a great reputation and did a really, really good job. They actually came in, we spent a little bit less than um, uh, their bid. Uh, they were nine point, you can correct me if I'm wrong, nine. $984,000 to do this project. The next lowest bid was $1.6 million. Wow. The next one was 2.4. Wow. So we did well with the contractor we got. Yes? Does the dredgings have to go someplace special? Uh, dredgings, do they have to go someplace special? Yes, they do, and we're going to get to that. Now, if I, this is where I'm supposed to play the video. If it doesn't work, I am going to leave. <laughs> so, we can do it this way, I think. 
Ah. Ah. There we go. Oh, look at that. It's sideways. <laughs> yeah, the little thingy should spin, right? Doesn't want to spin. Of course, it wasn't upside down or sideways in my office when I previewed it. I'm going to play it for you <coughs> one way or the other. Here we go. Oh. All right. Okay. Turn the screen. You know what? No, no. Here, let me tip the computer. Oh, wait, no. More than one way to skin a cat or dredge a harbor. Yeah. The question is, how many bodies did we find? I purposely didn't stick around when they were pulling stuff out. So I'm afraid my poor old computer is not. So everything below the low tide mark is actually owned in the public trust. But you can get a, a lease for 30 years to put in a facility through the Army Corps and DEP. Yep, I'm not gonna wait forever. All right. So what was the most interesting Move it back. What was the most interesting thing? It was supposed to be this video right here. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> What was the question again? What most interesting thing was, did they find? Did they find anything? Uh, lots. So uh, folks who were sitting around on the shore with VHF radios listening into the conversation as they were torturing each other uh, on board, it was a bunch of young guys, um, was the crane operator swearing profusely about the volume of chain that was on the bottom of the harbor. Wow. So. Lots and lots and lots of chain. Hmm. So it looks now like. So you see the little boxes right here on the computer screen? Uh -huh. uh, that orange tan spot was the previous, previous spot that the bucket grabbed. The purple is where they're lining up the bucket now to grab. I see. So that's. GPS? On the top of the boom for the bucket is a GPS antenna right over where the, the bucket is in the water. So so I, every time I see this, I, I'm worried that uh, Bob Reed's little boat is going to get filled with mud and water. <laughs> And I'm glad he's not here to see it. Are you, Bob? Good. <laughs> it was fun. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, we removed somewhere in the neighborhood of 24 to 26,000 in total. So there's the dump scow. If this is actually going to work. So you can see the, the boards that uh, are the sides 
this barge would be filled so that the, the mud would show just up over the top of those boards when it would go out. And in it goes. This uh, dump scow, when it arrived in Manchester, was brand new. Literally, when I went by it, I could smell the, the fresh paint. That's a, a, a real rarity. Most of the dump scows in the region are in a constant state of sinking. All right, so there, I think, <laughs> I think we got it. So that's how the, yes. Yes. You said we went to elevation in that nine? Eight feet. Eight, eight feet at low the, tide. What was the existing elevation? So different areas. Uh, there were some areas, areas where it was seven feet, only had to go down a foot. Um, huh? Other areas, uh, boats were going aground. There was one uh, lobsterman whose uh, lobster boat regularly went aground. There are right now uh, boaters in this room who experience uh, their boat going aground at their mooring. <laughs> and uh, out in Proctor Cove, Proctor Cove is one of our weak spots now, as well as the channel out past the Yacht Club. Actually, Proctor Cove and Whittier Cove, which we'll, we'll get to in a moment. So it's very exciting watching the uh, barge come out through the bridge the bridge had to go up as high as it could possibly go. A real strain when you're 70 plus years old to stand up that straight. And in order to get this barge through with the four feet of clearance on either side, they take this push boat and uh, lash it across the end and use it to steer the end of the barge like this as the tugboat pushed it out. As, as a a uh, really interesting operation. Here they are going out past the Yacht Club. Uh, I know that some folks in this room had the pleasure of seeing the barge go out at 3 o'clock in the morning <laughs> in the fog. <laughs> so where does it go? Uh, all of our spoil was approved we had a suitability permit which allowed us to dump this material offshore. Now, if this material had not been clean enough or uh, had been too contaminated, this material would have gone to a laydown area, all the water allowed to run off, spoils would have gone into a truck and driven to Ohio. It would have been a lot more expensive. <coughs> Instead, it went from Manchester to the Mass Bay Disposal Site, which was a 12-mile trip. 12 miles. So what's the depth out there? Is there a uh, little volcano of what's the oils? So right, out there it's not as deep as it used to be. <laughs> <laughs> and there's lots of stuff out there, lots of mooring chain. I know that. Um, but that's a, a state and federally uh, managed site. Isn't that where Stell Wagon is? No, no, it is not. Stell Wagon's out a lot further. Bion, is there such a thing as trying to recycle some of these things or dispose of them in a different manner? Well, so that's part of the discussion. We're taking uh, your backyard and giving it to the, the fish. Mm -hmm. And there is some talk going forward that uh, dredge spoils could be disposed of, or maybe not disposed of, but uh, composted and reused. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Has everything to do with the level of contamination. How much contamination was there? Uh, so there always is some, particularly if you're dredging around an old boat yard or a marina or a fueling facility or a chemical facility, or a power plant, uh, you're going to have some level of contamination. Presumably, as time goes by and we're better stewards <laughs> and we don't dump as much toxic material into the water, it's not going to get into the soil. So I would like to think that someday when we dredge, that material could presumably 
go back to some place where it would do something good like grow a tomato that you could throw at the harbor master when he's speaking <laughs> publicly. So here's a great, uh, uh, this was scanned and, and sent to me. This is presumably a painting of Manchester Harbor a long, long time ago. All right, here's more words. But this here is a report by the Chief of Engineers for the U.S. Army, uh, the Army Corps, in 1896. And this is discussing the, what we believe to be the initial first dredging of Manchester Harbor and the cost. So we look at uh, the costs here, 30,000, 34,000, 64,000, 46,000. Boy, I sure wish it only cost that much now. <laughs> I believe if, if we were to try to do the entire dredging uh, for this next project that we discussed, rather than finding ways to break it down, uh, the cost would be uh, north of two and a half million dollars. Uh, is that close to right, Jim? Do you remember? To dredge, do you remember what's, what's uh, the, cost of the, the next dredging? the next round of dredging? dredging? The next pool, I think. Two point four million. Oh, sorry, five point four million dollars. So you can we see, hope. right? We hope <laughs> because that's in the future, and nothing gets less expensive. So you can see why we're looking for methods to maybe not do all of the areas that need it if if we can find a way to to break it down. Does the revenue generated by the harbor come close to paying for that? So this last round of dredging, it, all the stars and planets lined up. It was a beautiful thing. One thing that Manchester, Manchester is exceptional. I say this a lot, and I know it might be a little maudlin, and I'd move on. But truth is, this, this community cares about its waterfront so much. And it invested uh, dollars into it before it ever asked for a dime from the state. You folks spent around a quarter of a million dollars in permitting and engineering to get this project going. You agreed to two mooring fee increases or waterway fund increases so that there would be money to put towards the engineering, uh, towards the actual construction piece. By the time we got to the point of hiring a contractor, the town had saved half a million dollars towards dredging. We'd asked the state for a million. We were expecting it to cost $1.5 million, we hoped, to do the job. Um, when we found PROC and they were the low bidder, and they were approximately a half a million dollars less than we expected, we went back to the state and said, we only need a half a million dollars. You're, you're going to give us a million. We only need half of that. The great thing was that, bless you, when they, when they heard that we only needed the half million and that we were only asking for that much, they made it very clear that the next time we dredge, we must come to them immediately and let them know. So a lot of goodwill. Uh, we had enough money. The state gave us a half a million dollars. The dredging is paid for. We didn't have to go out for a bond, which we were afraid we were going to have to. So, but as you can see, this next project at uh, $5.4 million, I don't know that we will be able to save that much in the ensuing years, in the next five to six years maybe seven years before the next round of dredging. We'll see. We are collecting more than we ever did before, but that's a big number. I think you're doing stuff like, aren't you building a new school? <laughs> <laughs> so late 1800s, we started dredging. So this picture here, I really apologize for the quality.
But I've seen this hanging on a wall in Skip Crocker's office since the first time I went over there to, to meet the Crocker family uh, in 2012. Well, except when I asked uh, Sam for a job when I was about 32 years old. <laughs> this here, I believe, is a photograph from the late 1800s when this harbor was first dredged. If I had the photograph here and could show it to you, you would see over here uh, an old barge with a tugboat sitting on the bottom heeled over. And out here by the Brewer House is a barge, uh, a dredge uh, hopper barge for taking the material offshore. And I'm pretty sure that this is the first time this harbor was ever dredged. So this, this photograph is of signi significant historical value when it comes to dredging this harbor. And I thank Skip a lot for, for letting me take it and, and try to make an image you could see, which I failed miserably at. So this here is a photograph of a portion of a chart from 1906, which shows the original channel that was dredged coming into Manchester Harbor. If you look right here, six and a half feet, seven feet, six feet, it did this really interesting thing. It took this turn and went in front of Long Beach, past the Long Beach Pier. I know there are some people in this room who remember that. And I'm not naming names. <laughs> and this, uh, this channel was the first thing that was dredged. Uh, th the report talked about there being three to four feet of navigable water at low tide until you reached the Narrows, which is this area right here. And then there was no water. So the Army Corps of Engineers dredged from the Narrows in through the drawbridge into what was Knight's Lumber so that the coal barges could come in and unload coal so that your grandparents, great-grandparents could be warm in the wintertime. This uh, comes from a chart that was given to me by someone who found a bunch of charts in their basement. And I have it right here, and this is going to the Historical Museum. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's not in great shape, but it, it could be preserved. It's a wonderful piece, and the town should have it in its museum. Wow. Thank you, Bobby. I don't know. This is, this is your history. I just get to be a small piece of it, and I'm thrilled. So, 1936, this is, this uh, picture over here was donated by a gentleman named Bob Pescucci who, who had it in his home, um, thought that the Harbor Department should have it in their office. I gave that to uh, the museum and this wonderful thing was created. I'd like to point out some things about the Harbor in 1936. So there is the rotunda. Here is the mooring field. <laughs> Here's Proctor Cove and the mooring field. I think uh, maybe Jim and Ann would have a, a mooring that might work. I don't think anybody else would. So let's come in and look at uh, Crocker's Boatyard right here. Sam, you might have had a little trouble at low tide launching boats. Yeah. <laughs> So we continue in, in under the drawbridge, and well, there is where your waste treatment plant will be. I shudder to think where everything went. <laughs> <laughs> Weren't they building PT boats at a... Uh, no, no, don't get ahead of us here. <laughs> patience, patience. Youth. Also, I'd like to point out, you can see here, this side of the harbor as well was a mud flat. 
this harbor has benefited immensely from dredging. If we do not dredge, this is what this harbor will be. Now, I have been desperately looking back through records that I've lost because if I understand it correctly, in Whittier Cove, Tucks Point side, uh, where the moorings are, then there's that inner part that goes in behind the Yacht Club. Right before World War I, that had been approved to be dredged to depth. And then World War II, I'm sorry, World War II happened. And there was no money for dredging. I didn't find that, but I did find another project from 1938, a breakwater. The Army Corps was going to put in a breakwater from Magnolia Point to Kettle Island, which would have completely changed the nature of that harbor right there. Uh, it would have been exposed to the southwest, but all the northeast storms would have been a non-issue in there at all. So that was a project that was planned for Manchester and never came to fruition. So somebody was asking about PT boats. Um, I forget, it begins with the C. Manchester Marine was called, not? Calderwoods. Calderwoods, it was Calderwoods, okay. So this is Calderwoods and they built sub chasers right. right there. So here's a tug to help move things around. This is a great photo here. And I'd like to thank Sam Crocker for loaning me these photos. I didn't put all of them in here, but to have these photographs, it's, it's priceless. It's priceless. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a PT boat there. It had just been launched. Um, Was there plywood boats? No, these weren't. These weren't plywood, were they? Uh, no, they were. <laughs> yeah, th they didn't look it from the photos. World War II. Right, World War II. And here's one that's being framed up over here. So there we go. There's one that's just been launched. And this one was the one that was uh, anchored just about where your floats are now. Yeah. Right, so this is right in front of where Crocker's boatyard is now. Is that the Sam Crocker 135? <laughs> 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 You're so fresh, Roy. Do you know about how many were produced? Sam, do you know how many? I don't. I've often wondered myself. So I'll just go with my stock answer. It's a wicked lot. <laughs> <laughs> and here's one that's uh, ready for sea trials. Uh, looks like gun turret there, another one up here, and there might have been a crocker who had something to do with that, if I'm not mistaken. So I was looking at this photo and thinking to a, a more modern uh, naval vessel, thinking of the uh, uh, USS Cole with the small boat that went careening toward it and blew a hole in the side and killed all those poor sailors. Uh, and I was looking at this small boat here. <laughs> right. Uh, but this is something that I actually teach in the safe boating classes that I was talking about, that we don't go near naval vessels anymore. You just don't, you don't go near them. And here, here it could be done with impunity. Look at that crane in the background. It's not yellow. It's not yellow. You're right. But the bridge is the same. <laughs> All right, so changed harbor. There's a lot of changes in the harbor. Uh, this was the best I could do, a representation of uh, what the channel looked like going in past the Long Beach Pier. Uh, as you can see, it's pretty shallow right there. Um, this, I was out uh, this day that I took this picture, you could walk out almost literally to the edge of the channel. And uh, where that carries across into the channel is where we're having our greatest degree of silting. Uh, and <coughs> some of our larger uh, sailboats are 
deepest draft, I should say, sailing vessels coming in and out of the harbor have reported hitting there on a low tide. So, and then uh, the modern channel, which just comes right straight in. This, this old channel also went on the opposite side of Bowbell Ledge, which is our greatest navigation hazard inside the harbor. So today, this is what a modern chart looks like and all of the navigational aids. Although, uh, as you look at this older chart, if anyone comes to the museum to look at this, this older chart, uh, nuns two and four, right here and right here, are on that chart as well. Marking white rock and half tide rock, which a lot of people still manage to run into. <laughs> So Manchester has changed a lot, um, continues to change. Uh, the challenge with change is maintain, trying to maintain that flavor and character that we know and love and that many of you have experienced your whole lives uh, without falling behind and um, putting the harbor at risk of having to do abrupt changes that will, will change things completely and utterly. That's, that's part of the task uh, that I see for the harbor department to, to preserve and move ahead. In case you were wondering, this is right out by glass head. Uh, this is an area that needs dredging, so I love to end <laughs> with that. So, any questions? Let's see if I can figure out how to turn on the lights here. <laughs> so, any questions? Oh, yes. Right. So there are time of year time of year restrictions are called. Uh, the creatures that actually live in the environment that we like to recreate in, the ones that we like to eat, <laughs> they have specific times of years year where they like to get together, be romantic, <laughs> and create new things that we like to eat. So the time of year restriction for dredging around here has a lot to do with the winter flounder. Uh, also sturgeon, although sturgeon isn't really something that we see here, although we could because we do have brackish water. Uh, if the Central Street dam project ever happens uh, and that's open to the tide, that brackish water could potentially support uh, a breeding ground for Atlantic sturgeon. So it's fisheries, mainly. When did the harbor, get the straight entrance into the harbor get dredged? So that's a really good question. I don't know when it went from the loop-de-loop -loop right. yeah. to the straight job. Anybody? I'm going to guess the 1950s or 60s. It must have been early 50s. Okay, so or probably for when they were doing those coasters, the, the boats, right? Yeah, they would have had those for an hour. So, so right, point just made. Yeah. Probably when it was dredged for the war effort to get the uh, really fast sub chasers in and out. So that was a good. The government then paid for that. So uh, that's an interesting point that I didn't put in the slideshow. Your harbor used to be a federal navigation project. And federal nav navigation projects still exist today. Uh, many harbors are. And when you're a federal navigation project, the federal government, Army Corps of Engineers, is responsible for dredging your harbor. They have to come in and, and take care of it and maintain it. It's their responsibility. 
not the communities. Now, if you need dredging around piers or outside of that specific area of responsibility, you're going to pay for that. <coughs> but um, at some point, the town voted to deauthorize the Federal Navigation Project. So I know everybody is moaning and groaning, all that money, oh! <coughs> the problem with the Federal Navigation Project, there would not be 600 moorings in this harbor. <laughs> there would not. Uh, the channel would absolutely be wide open and clear. Every aspect of the Federal Navigation Project would be wide open. There would be no boats in it. There would be no floats in it. There would be no piers, ramps, no fun or joy of any kind. <laughs> so that there, a lot of communities deauthorize, vote to deauthorize, and the Corps is happy to do it because then they're not responsible for it anymore. Um, so that's that's an important aspect. In regard to that biome, can you speak to the fact that they were going to require us to make all of those boat yards, not boat yards, I don't know the right terms, but the floats off of Norton's Point in order to maintain receiving those funds? Well, the fact that they were going to have to be removed? Added. They were requiring the addition of 500. Of 500. And we debated, we negotiated with them, and they finally agreed to something like between 150 and 200, I can't remember exactly, but Manchester didn't want to be told what to do. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. It's good to be independent, isn't it? <laughs> so uh, that's, that's a big part of any FNP. If the federal government requires you to do something, you have no choice. So we're not an FNP anymore, however, as part of this last dredging project, we did run into trouble with the Corps. Not dissimilar. Uh, the floats over at Morse Pier, where the police boat, harbor master boat tied up, and the fishermen had never been permitted. <laughs> the Army Corps, looking at satellite pictures with their you know, little uh, magnifying glass, said, that doesn't belong there. I got a phone call in 2013. You're, we're not giving you a permit to dredge the harbor. <laughs> what do we need to do? Well, those floats don't belong there. I said, they'll be gone today. Yeah. I moved them and sent them a picture. And they called me back and said, OK, you're back on. <laughs> so we had to go through the process of getting the state DEP Chapter 91 and Army Corps permit in order to put those floats back in place. Now, not to alarm anyone, <laughs> the floats at Tux Point were permitted in 1896. <laughs> if you make any change to the structure, you must re-permit. There might have been a couple of changes <laughs> since 1896. So the Army Corps could tomorrow call me and say, those floats aren't uh, permitted. Get them out of there. So we are in the process of um, working with CLE, Foth Engineering, of getting those floats <coughs> permitted. Now, I have every confidence that if the Corps were to reach out to us and say, those aren't permitted, we would be able to tell them it's in the pipeline, You'll be able to see the records coming through your office. We understand, and we're working to correct it. So we'll be able to beg forgiveness, I think, and not have those taken away. That would really cause a lot of distress, and I quit. <laughs> so these, these issues with permitting are, are really important. Uh, if we, there are a couple of other um, things that are needing to be dealt with before we'll be able to dredge in Proctor Cove or the channel. The good news is we're working on it, and I expect any red flags to be gone <coughs> before the Army Corps rules on our next dredging permit. Which is heavier, uh -oh. the pile of permits or the spoil taken out of the <laughs> Or my heart if we don't get the permit. Uh, it's a toss-up. It's a toss-up. 
Yes. Is there any logical reason for the great disparity in the cost of the bids? Greed, <laughs> avarice. What I mean is, is there anything yeah. that one guy was bidding on that cost more nope. that we didn't want? It was just no. So Proc is uh, Marine, who, who won the contract. They're a Maine company. I come from Maine. We like a sharp pencil on our bids. <laughs> will they be bidden on the next round? <laughs> yes, they will. Okay, good. Yeah. yeah, they've already expressed an interest in coming back. And as long as I'm here, it'll still be a sharp pencil. <laughs> <laughs> what about a suction uh, dredge system rather than a... Sure, pump? sure, the hydraulic. Uh, so the core actually tells you which kind you must use. Oh. So, oh, really? yep, yeah, th that I'll Army Corps. Or yeah. you use the suction on the outgoing tide. Right, so uh, the Saugus River was dredged 20 years ago, and they used the, the suction hydraulic dredge and pulled the muck out of the bottom of the Saugus River, highly contaminated, and it was piped directly over to the Resco uh, power to energy plant across Route 107. Went right, they pumped it right straight there. Never went on a barge, never went in on a truck, just <laughs> gone. Um, um, maybe some people who are more senior than I am sitting here in the audience. <coughs> I've always heard that the land that the Legion post is on was uh, filled with dredge spoils from the inner harbor at some point. Is there any truth to that? Or I was told that it was uh, material from Route 128 <laughs> when 128 went in because 128 doesn't exist. So it could be a combination of both or one or the other. Yeah, because 128 went through Manchester <laughs> in about 1954, 50, 55. Mm -hmm. no, one, 49. 49? The Gloucester branch was the first straight run. <coughs> so, I I would suspect if I would suspect that dredge spoils could be part of it. Uh, I don't know. I wasn't born then. <laughs> does the dredge does the spoil barge just open on the bottom? Right. Oh, that's a great question. So these uh, hopper barges are really neat things. They do. They just there are doors on the bottom. They get to the dump site and the doors open and everything falls out. Yeah, the overhead shots of those are, are fascinating. The barge is towed and it's leaving a big plume behind it. Now, the Army Corps became concerned that some of these dredging companies might not be going the whole 12 miles <laughs> before opening the doors. Right. So all of the modern dump scows now are fitted with um, GPS trackers and monitors that allow the, the Army Corps down in Concord to sit at a computer and monitor exactly where and when those doors are opened. Yeah. That's why they always left at 3 in the morning. That's why they always left at 3 in the morning. That's right. <laughs> Uh, questions about other things besides uh, dredging, too. Well, just a quick one, Brian. The site that you sh indicated where they dumped this effluent, <laughs> be careful. <laughs> is that the same spot as the old dumping ground off Boston? Approximately. Is it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a big yellow buoy out there. <coughs> so, yes. No, no. Uh, putting in a breakwater is extremely expensive, uh, tens of millions of dollars. Uh, we looked at it in Kittery. Like the wall. Like the wall, right. Uh, the, uh, the breakwater up in Kittery was going to cost $57 million. Whoa. Maybe we can get Gloucester to pay for it. Yeah, right. <laughs> we'll build it. Oh, wait, That's was that a Gloucester. pig that just flew overhead? <laughs> Channel Ridge, and I was doing 
Yes. You mentioned, I can't remember the name, that ledge. Oh, yeah, Bobel. Bobel. Can they blast that out of the way? Um, I know that's no. a problem. No. Could have. Could have. Right. That, a lot of that sort of thing was done. Hell's Gate going down the East River in New York had some awful ledge that was blown up. Uh, Henderson Point on the Piscataqua River off the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard had a big nasty ledge that was blown up. Nowadays, uh, I think you'd be hard pressed to, to get a permit to do such a thing. Can you ask for the permit afterwards? Well, right. <laughs> yeah, you can ask for it afterwards after I leave. <laughs> They went on the other side. They went on. They went on the uh, south side, southeast side of Bobel. The channel did, and back in rather than I was told, and I would love to know if this is true that the rotunda used to extend further out into the harbor. Yeah, I've heard that too. So I don't know, but yes. Yeah, years ago on the harbor committee, the Bobel was discussed at length. Yeah. And the voters. <coughs> on the committee said, no way are you going to take Bobel out. And the reason is it dampens the waves coming in the harbor. Well, not to mention the sheer entertainment value in the summertime. Yeah. Right. Right. Sure. Oh gosh, that's a good point. Okay, so uh, for those who don't get my Waterline newsletter or didn't read the Salem Evening News, the very old Bowditch Ledge in Salem Sound collapsed. Um, I actually have some great pictures of it four hours before, eight hours before, four hours before, four hours after, it's gone. So it's just at low tide, it's just a pile of rubble. So those of us who boat in Salem Sound need to be extra cautious. There's now a buoy over there near it, like there is at Half Tide Rock here in Manchester. As we know, that the buoys aren't always the, the greatest help for people who don't read charts. Charts are a wealth of information. They're a wonderful, wonderful thing. Are they going to be doing anything about reconstructing it? I, so as far as, if I were going to I guess. A GoFundMe page. A GoFundMe page, <laughs> right. Uh, if I were going to guess, the United States Coast Guard, who's responsible for navigational aids, will eventually put a spindle in. Yeah. And that will be it if they do that. So, one more hazard in Salem Sound. Uh, Mother Nature, it just, uh, time and tide waits for no stone monument. It was interesting because if, if you'd been going by it the last couple of three years, there was one seam that was opening up, opening up, opening up, and then finally we, we had a storm and the wrong rock fell out. Is that it?